Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody in this afternoon, and we realize many of you are here for the first time. Some are from out of state, and uh, more than I can... Uh, recognize individually, but we're glad you're here, and uh, we trust the Lord will bless your time with us. For those of you out in television, again, we just want to invite you to keep doing what you're doing. Take your notes and study and learn to search the scriptures on your own. And again, we always want to thank everyone for your prayers, your financial help, and most of all for your complimentary and your encouraging letters. My, it helps, doesn't it, Mom? When uh, we can read how the Word is blessing more and more hearts. All right, now the first thing I'm going to have to explain, especially to my audience that's been with me all these years with that old music stand, I had a call and a fellow up in Minnesota wanted to know if he could make a pulpit for me, or a podium, I guess he called it. And I said, no, not really, because I said, uh, all our mail says never change a thing. And I said, that's going to include my old music stand, even though it was getting pretty dilapidated. It wasn't mine. It belongs to the studio here. But uh, then he sent me a picture of it with a nice note, and he said, if you'll take it, he said, I'll deliver it. Well, what are you going to do? So anyway, uh, he brought it clear down from northern Minnesota and uh, left it here at the studio for us. And so we're going to use it. But if I get a lot of flack from my TV audience that they want the music stand, I'm going to have to give the podium to the station and I'll pick up my old music stand. Now, you know, that's the way our program has been set. I, I, I try to, you know, be communicable with my audience and tell you what takes place. But this is the reason you see me behind a different... Uh, Podium. Okay, we're going to pick right up where we left off in our last program, which is a month ago now, in our taping sessions. Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. Now, as I reviewed the programs, I know I did a lot of just reading verses without much comment because there was just no other way to do it. And uh, so I kind of apologize to my audience for that. But from here on now, we're going to be able to do a lot of what we normally do, comparing Scripture with Scripture. But uh, some of these chapters, as we covered in the last taping, you just couldn't do that. So here in Daniel chapter 7, we're going to drop in at verse 9. And remember, in the first eight verses of this chapter, Daniel had a dream, a vision dream, in which he saw the progression of the same Gentile empires that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream, whereas Nebuchadnezzar saw metals, gold, silver, brass, iron, and so forth, Daniel sees them pictured as beasts of prey. And you remember back there in the first part of the chapter, the first, which was Babylon, was pictured as a lion, and then he comes up with the bear, and then the leopard, and then the Roman Empire was something that was beyond description. All right, so that was Daniel's approach to these coming world empire. Now again, let me emphasize, see, this is exactly why the scoffers have ridiculed Daniel as being a forgery, because how could Daniel foretell these coming empires so explicitly and so correctly unless it had been written after the fact? Well, you see, the scoffer knows nothing of Holy Spirit inspiration. God knows God knows the end from the beginning, and uh, even as we are today, 2,000 years removed from the time of Christ, and yet we are exactly where Scripture says we would be. And so as we look back at our, our own past election, even from, from the believer's point of view, we have to recognize that God puts these people in office. And uh, even though we, we try to do what we have to do, yet we have to recognize that God is in sovereign control. He knows the end from the beginning. And so he could very readily show Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar the progress of these Gentile empires. All right, so now then after he finishes that dream of these coming world empires, as we see them coming on the scene today, in that same dream, now we pick up verse 9, <clears throat> I beheld, or he was a viewer of all these things in his vision, 
until the thrones were cast down. In other words, all these Gentile empires have come and gone, and they have now gone into the dustbin of eternal history. And so he beheld or looked at this dream until the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, which is a reference to God the Father, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool, his throne. See, now this speaks of the throne in heaven, where God we normally speak of as being seated on the throne. God the Father. God the Son is not on the throne in heaven. God the Father is. All right? And so the Father's throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Now, I've said it before, I get a little disturbed when people write books and try to explain heaven. Because whenever they use scripture to describe heaven, they're always using the description of the kingdom. The thousand year reign. Listen, that is not heaven. That's merely the thousand year millennial reign of Christ on earth. And uh, it takes a stretch to go into the eternal heaven of the heavens because Scripture gives us no clue. All we know is it's going to be glorious. But we do have a little bit of a picture of the throne room itself, which is certainly not all of heaven. And to get a little, little glimpse of that, turn back with me to Ezekiel. And the reason I'm doing that is because of the word wheels in this verse I just read, see? His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. All right, now to pick that up, come back with me, like I said, to Ezekiel chapter 1. And that's where we have the description of these wheels. <clears throat> Got it? E Ezekiel chapter 1. And, uh, oh, let's see. Let's come down to verse 4. Verse 4. I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire, and out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. All right, now we have the description then of these angelic beings and, and likenesses and so forth, but come all the way down to verse... 16. And then you find the word that brought me back here. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of a barrel, that's a gemstone, and the four had one likeness, their appearance and their work was, it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Now your imagination can picture that as well as mine. Now, I had someone try to paint something like that one time and send it to me. But it's just something that's beyond us. And the only reason I'm showing this is because the word is used in Daniel and again in Ezekiel. All right, now then we also have a picture of it to a degree back in Revelation. So if you'll come back with Revelation with me a moment, and uh, we get that same kind of a connotation of the fiery flames and so forth that are pictured in the heavenly part and the throne room in the book of Revelation. And, uh, oh, let me see. Where do I have to go? I, I had one picked out. But come with me first to chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. And drop in at verse Two, just for sake of time. Revelation chapter 4, verse 2. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. The throne upon which God the Father is where we see positioned. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. There was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Now see, we... We can't imagine this. This is beyond human comprehension, see? 
All right, around about the throne were four and twenty thrones, and upon the thrones I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. All right, now jump up to verse 6. And just remember, we're comparing this now with Ezekiel and Daniel. Verse 6, and before the throne, that is the throne in the heaven of the heavens, not the throne that Christ will sit on in Jerusalem. This is in the heavenlies. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four creatures, living beings, full of eyes, before and behind, and so forth. All right, then I think that's far enough here for now in the book of Revelation. So if you'll come back with me again to Daniel chapter 7. So always remember that when it comes to describing the heaven to which we're going, we can only go just so far. We just cannot comprehend the glory and the beauty of what we're going to call our abode. Now, I had one writer stipulate that from some little pieces of Scripture that there would be mountains and rivers and so forth. Well, maybe, maybe not. But all I know is it's going to be so glorious that even the Apostle Paul was not permitted to describe it. That's why the Lord put that pressure on him with the, uh, what did he call it, the uh, thorn in the flesh, in order to remind him to never share what he saw up in glory. Now, if Paul wasn't permitted to show it, who in the world has got the brass today to say that they've got the right? So that's the only reason I can put on it, is that it is so far beyond our human understanding that God knows it's no use trying to describe it. And so that's the way we'll leave it. It's going to be glorious. It's going to be fantastic beyond comprehension. All right, now back to Daniel chapter 7 then. After uh, the reference of the wheels as burning fire in verse 9. Now verse 10. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. In other words, from the throne room. Thousand thousands. Now, you're getting used to the word trillion, so you shouldn't have any trouble with thousands. <laughs> you know, i got to bring these things in once in a while because I like to see these people smile. You know, back when I was young, there was a famous senator from the state of Illinois who I think at the time was probably chairman of the Finance Committee by the name of Everett Dirksen. Remember him? Good man. Everett Dirksen was a good man. And I'll never forget reading one time as the committee was discussing budget. Do you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Oh, Everett Dirksen says, now wait a minute, fellas. You're talking millions and millions. Then it won't be long, it'll be billions. <laughs> well, poor old Everett wouldn't have been able to take it if he'd hear him today. Trillions. Do you know how much a trillion is? There's no way of knowing, because I think I read a while back, there are less than a trillion seconds between now and the time of Christ. I mean, it's just beyond us, see? So anyway, here we've got millions. A thousand thousand is a million, see? All right, not even a trillion, a million. Verse 10, a fiery stream mission came forth before him, thousand thousands, millions ministered unto him, and 10,000 times 10,000, that's 100,000 in my understanding, or is that a million? Anyway, they stood before him, and the judgment was set, and the books were open. Now, of course, that leaps up to the great white throne, see? Verse 11, I beheld them because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. Now, remember, we talked of the little horn up there in verse 8 in our last program. And... Uh, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning fire. Now remember who the beast is in Scripture. It's the Antichrist. All right, now again, keep your hand in Daniel. We're going to go back to Revelation and see exactly how perfectly Daniel fits with the book of Revelation. All right, when we get to the end of the tribulation... And the Antichrist has been holding forth for the previous seven years. 
and the false prophet, the religious leader. And as I mentioned, I think in our last taping, if you're aware at all of what's taking place in Christendom, there's that constant push, meeting after meeting after meeting, to bring all the religions of the world under one head. And that, of course, in the tribulation will be the false prophet. All right, so the false prophet and the Antichrist are men, born of women, flesh and blood, but they have been satanically empowered. All right, now here's their end, even as Daniel showed it. Revelation 19, verse 20. Revelation 19, verse 20. And the beast, the man Antichrist, was taken, and with him the false prophet, the religious leader, whoever he is. And these two men wrought miracles, be, or the false prophet, I'm sorry, the false prophet, the religious leader, wrought miracles before the Antichrist, with which he deceived them who had received the mark of the beast. Now remember that all goes back in those previous seven years of tribulation. With which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. Remember all that back in the earlier chapters of Revelation. Now look at their noon. Look at their end. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. All right, flip back to Daniel, and again, just to make sure you get it all locked in. Verse 11 again. I beheld even until the Antichrist, the beast, was slain, and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. All right, now then go on in Daniel to verse 12. Concerning the rest of the beast, that is, the cohorts with the man Antichrist and these Gentile empires, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. All right, now we'll go down into verse 13. I saw in the night visions. Now this is still Daniel continuing on with his own dream or vision, however you want to call it. Now in his next night vision, behold, one like the Son of Man. That's a reference, of course, from the Old Testament of God the Son as we know him and as we've been teaching in the daily program lately in the book of Hebrews. That God the Son, Jesus of Nazareth, the Creator God. All right, now he sees him in this Old Testament dream, and he comes with the clouds of heaven, came to the ancient of days, which again is a picture of God the Son coming before God the Father, he comes before him, and there was given him, verse 14, dominion, power, authority, and glory, and a kingdom. And this kingdom will include all people, nations, languages, and they're going to serve him. His dominion, or his rule, his government, his kingship, is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. All right, now before I comment any further on that, let's again jump up to Revelation. Now go to chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, and, and you know, you can't study Daniel without studying Revelation or vice versa. When we did the book on Revelation way back in our little books, what, 11, 12, 13? That's exactly what I did. I went back and forth between Daniel and Revelation. Well, now that we're studying Daniel, we'll have to do the same thing, only the other way around. We'll go from Daniel to Revelation. Chapter 5. Daniel, I mean, Revelation chapter 5. Remembering what Daniel just said, that he saw the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, and he came before the Ancient of Days, and the, the Father gave to him dominion and glory and a kingdom. All right, now in Revelation chapter 5, then, we can pick it up right here in verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now you got the picture? God the Father, seated on the throne, at least positionally. And he has a book or a scroll written within and the backside. Now, you see, it had to be a scroll because they, they didn't make books back in those times. I don't know why the translators used it at all. But a scroll, and it was rolled up. Now, it stands to reason. If you unroll that scroll and what you write will be on the inside when you roll it up. 
You can picture that. All right, and then after it's rolled up, if you want to put something on the outside, yes, you can write on the outside of the scroll. Now picture all that because that's the point. All the details of this scroll, which is really a mortgage on planet Earth between God and Satan, and all the details are written on the open side, but when it was rolled up and sealed, then you have information on the outer part of the scroll. All right, now then, reading on. I still it back in Daniel. Sorry about that. Revelation chapter 5, reading on. And so he saw an angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy or who is able to open the scroll and to loose the seals thereof. Now again, this was going back to antiquity, maybe not long before Israel, but anyway, they already had the whole idea of buying and selling land and property with mortgages. Yeah, I think a lot of us got the idea that this is all a modern day phenomenon. No, it isn't. They had mortgages clear back at the time of Ruth. Do you remember that? How that uh, Boaz had to pay the price of redemption to get the inheritance back. So it's nothing new. So the scripture is right in line with what everybody understood, that when you signed a mortgage, it was detailed, rolled up, and sealed with the things that mattered first on the outside. Now, it's the same principle that we've got today. If you're really on top of things and you're buying a piece of property that is mortgaged, you won't take the person's word for it, how much the mortgage is. What do you do? Either you or your real estate agent or the attorney, where are they going to go? The courthouse. And you go into the recorder. And you ask if you can see the copy of this mortgage of the property that you're buying. Well, what's the purpose? So that you know exactly the financial situation of that piece of property or you'll get taken. And it was the same way back in antiquity. Those details were all written on a mortgage and sealed. Same way with this spiritual mortgage. God made a mortgage with Satan when Satan picked up dominion of planet Earth. See? Now, when did Satan pick up dominion of planet Earth? Well, when Adam fell. It was Adam's dominion. He was to have control of the whole planet. Everybody thinks in that little Garden of Eden. No, Adam had dominion of the whole planet. And when he disobeyed God, he dropped the ball. Who picked it up? Satan did. All right, but Satan didn't just pick it up and glibly go his way. God set up a mortgage <laughs> in so many words. And that mortgage is going to demand payment before, once again, it becomes God's dominion. All right, now that's the whole picture here of mortgages through Scripture is to get us ready for this scenario in heaven of Revelation 5. We've got a mortgage, details, sealed, but on the outside are certain details pertinent for the immediate. All right, now verse 5. I'm going to run out of time if I don't hurry. And one of the elders up there in glory... One of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Who's that? That's Jesus Christ, see? So the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed. He has maintained his ability to open the scroll and to loose the seven seals. In other words, make time or make it ready to pay off. Now verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and the four creatures, and in the middle of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain. In other words, a reference to Christ again, crucifixion, his death as the true atonement. All right. And there stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. And then verse 7, He... God the Son, the Lamb of God, came and took the scroll out of the right of hand of him who sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, 
the four living creatures and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps, golden vials full of sweet odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And then verse 9, they sang a new song. Why? It's the beginning of the end of the curse of planet Earth, that God is now ready to pay off Satan in full and take back once again that which he had one time owned and controlled and lost because of Adam. All right, so reading on in verse 9, they sang a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book. Now remember, what made him worthy? His death, burial, and his resurrection. Now, I'm going to keep hammering away at resurrection because I had a phone call early this morning before we left. The guy said, just like I've mentioned over and over, why, he said, do so many people talk about Christ's death and they totally ignore the resurrection? And I'm afraid we are all aware of that. But listen, the work of the cross was not complete without the resurrection. He had to be raised from the dead in order to continue the whole unfolding of God's plan for the ages. Don't ever discount the resurrection as part of the plan of salvation. All right, and so here it is again. They sang a new song, and they said, Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us under our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Now, you always got to remember that John is a Jew, and the whole book of Revelation is directed primarily to Israel. So don't put us in here. This is not church age language. This is all God dealing with Israel. And uh, then uh, verse 12, this picks up the resurrection. And they said with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power. Now that's where I have to stop a moment. Where was his power exercised? At resurrection. Resurrection power, see? All right, and so he was given the power, riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. And in verse 13, every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth, such as in the sea, all of them are all under his dominion now once again. Blessing, and honor, and glory, and power be unto him to sit on the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And this is the whole concept then of the end time scenario. That because of what Christ accomplished on the cross with his death, his shed blood, his burial, and his resurrection. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Veldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.